You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Island View with hosts Teresa O'Leary and Marshall Freeze. Welcome back to Island View, a weekly current affairs show about Gabriola Island. I'm Teresa O'Leary. And I'm Marshall Fries. Thanks for joining us. While children are back to school and summer is nearly over, the extreme wildfire situation still is active in BC and Canada. So today on the show, Marshall will attend an emergency preparedness meeting in the Wild Cherry neighborhood of Gabriola. couple of recommendations for you just for when you're out and about and one of them is carry a fire extinguisher in your car. You see people tossing butts and a wildfire could start up really quickly and if you happen to be right there with your extinguisher you can safely and quickly put it out. So uh, I would encourage you to carry a fire extinguisher in your car right now particularly. And the same thing uh, in your yards. Um, have your hose with a spray nozzle on it so that if something starts just outside your front yard, you've got water right there to stop it. So let's talk in close to your house, uh, Fire Smart. So just a couple of quick facts about wildfire. Uh, the first thing is that we all worry about wildfire coming in and devouring a neighborhood. But your biggest wildfire risk is not from that. It is from burning embers. We all heard, I'm sure, that it was likely burning embers crossing the Okanagan Lake uh, a week or two ago and starting spot fires. That is your big risk, and that's what we attempt to tackle with FireSmart. So if you haven't had a FireSmart home assessment, I strongly encourage you to sign up for one. We'll come and talk to you about your own individual yard and your own individual risks. So the other thing about that is that 50% of houses lost due to wildfire are lost from burning embers. So it's a big risk to you. So what I'm gonna to do today is just give you a really brief, quick, uh, what you can do right now to fire smart your house and not take a lot of time to do it. So first of all, gutters. If embers go into your gutters and, and there's um, combustible debris, pine needles, pine cones, all that stuff, they can start a small fire, it'll go under your nice metal roof, start burning the sheathing, and you lose your house. So keeping your gutters clean, I know it's a huge challenge for us, but it makes a big difference for fire smarting your property. So the next thing that I would encourage you to do is walk around your house. If you've had a fire smart home assessment, you'll know that we recommend five feet of clearance all the way around your house that's non-combustible. So a, a fire couldn't catch on the grass and then come right up to your house and potentially you've got uh, cedar sh siding, as many of us do, that would instantly catch. So if you've got a five foot non-combustible zone around your house, you will protect yourself potentially from a fire getting in. And so many of us, we have part of that done and not all of it, so I just encourage you to go expand your five foot zone a little more because this is a long term project. Uh, next, get combustible debris away from your foundation. So many people have wood piles or valuable building materials, all kinds of stuff right in around the foundation. Of course, it's very combustible right now. It's really dry. If you can get it away for the summer, I get you want your wood pile near your house for the winter, 
but for the summer it will be much safer if you could move it out away from your house. Uh, another thing as you're walking around your house, look at, look at the um, shrubbery that's around your house. So if you're seeing dead leaves and dead branches, you're thinking fire starter. So the more you can clean that out and have green, it's less combustible. So I'd encourage you to uh, just take a look and try to clean that up just a little bit more. What else? Grass. Grass is highly combustible, but if it's really short, it's, it's a low risk, particularly if you've got a good five foot uh, barrier. So no matter what time of year it is, you can always use your electric weed whacker with nylon string, but now you can mow as well. So keep your grass really short. It's actually pretty good uh, as fire resistance if, if it's really short. Uh, what else? Big grasses, you know, your ornamental grasses, we love them. The pampas grass, uh, all those fountain grasses, they're all starting to die and be beautiful seed heads. They are quite combustible. So think about it, if they're close to your house, they are, you know, ember goes in and woof, they go up and then your house is going to go with it. So a little farther away from your house for big grassy things or those things that have oils the lavender, the rosemary, the junipers, the, you know, cedars, our most combustible tree. We have lots of big ones. I know we can't necessarily fix that, but think about your ornamentals around your house, what you've got, if it's a fire resistant plant or not. And we have good resources to help you make those decisions if you want to know. Uh, I can share that with you or in the home assessment, I will give you uh, material as well. So, there's a wildfire on the island. What are you gonna do for Fire Smart? Number one, the minute you hear there's a wildfire on the island, you wanna move fast with Fire Smart because you do not wanna wait until you're evacuating. But it, the more you can do, the better chance your house has of making it through a wildfire. So first of all, walk around the house. Like I said, is there combustible stuff that you meant to move away from the foundation and just haven't? Get it away right away. If you've got a big wood pile that's less than 30 feet from the house and you can put up poly plastic or tarps, then an ember might hit it, do a little melt, but if it falls right to the non-combustible ground, it won't burn. But you know your wood pile is gonna be a huge fire if, if embers get in there. So think about that, poly plastic on high risk areas to prevent fire from getting into them or embers from getting into them. The other thing is make sure all your windows and vents are closed before you leave the house and remove all combustibles from your decks or anywhere around your house. So your lawn furniture, your mats, plastic, wicker, wood, get it all away as much as you can. And then if you've identified, because we we talked to you about where's your high risk areas, if you know of a high risk area in your yard and you've got time, think about water. Uh, it won't be effective if there's days and days between when you water and when the fire hits, but it's not going to hurt and maybe it's going to make the difference. So one last thing is your cars, of course, are highly combustible. If you've got a car you're leaving behind, I would encourage you to get it out on the road. Now make sure the road is passable for fire vehicles, but get it 30 feet away from your house. And the same with your little propane tanks. They are highly combustible. So the little portable ones with your barbecue, you want to store them upright in an outbuilding, or if you don't have an outbuilding, 30 feet away from your house, sitting upright, not on their side. Um, and lastly, uh, Arbutus, Building Supply has put up a cart with all kinds of fire smart uh, materials on it and they're adding to it daily. So if you have read anything um, online or you've had a home assessment and you want to make some changes, they're a great resource and they're, they're getting better all the time with composite decking and uh, <coughs> you know, uh, fire resistant siding and even just the metal vents that we recommend. 
So um, I would encourage you to go there if you need fire smart stuff. And the last thing I'll say is if you have not had a home assessment, I really encourage you to sign up. Confidential, free, takes less than an hour. We're just outside and we'll just talk to you about your own home and what you can do to make it safer. So I will pass this around and uh, collect them on, at the back on my way out. And thank you very much for your time. Are there questions? I've been teaching neighborhood emergency preparedness program as long as I've been part of uh, ESS Gabriola. And I think it's the most important aspect of neighborhood emergency preparedness. It's the most important thing you can possibly do as a neighborhood. You're not alone. I have probably eight or 900 people involved in the neighborhood emergency preparedness program. And I bet you didn't know that, but I'm also very discreet about how, what I do in the, in the neighborhood emergency preparedness programs. I do not share emails with anyone, no matter how much they pressure me. And that includes the politicians when they want to get elected. So if you want to share a team leader's name, address, perhaps a, a way for me to communicate with a team leader and two other people in, that are in that group, then I can send you little tidbits of information that I get handed off to me from people like BC Hydro giving me a super hit, head alert on a power outage, or um, I can notify you if I am notified by Environment Canada about a storm coming or anything. But I'd like to see that you have a team leader and at least two other people in this group who are prepared to, to uh, um, be a team leader and contact me if anything's happening with respect to your neighborhood. One of the first things I'd suggest, how many people have joined Voyant Alert? Oh, good. If you haven't done that already, this is the first and most important thing I'd like you to do today. Go online, find the website for the RDN, and become part of the program of notification. It has its limits. But if there's any kind of an emergency notification that it's important to get the information into everybody's hands immediately, your phone will ring and tell you the announcement. And so unless the power lines, of course, are broken, and it happens from time to time. But TELUS is particularly good at, um, at uh, getting messages out and having the lines intact. And I can't say <coughs> that except for one time when I lost my power about three years ago because my line was cut all the rest of the time they're on. So you it, don't have a cell phone. Well, you don't have to have a cell phone if you have any kind of phone. Okay. And if you have a cell phone and a landline, put both that information on there because maybe you're not at home and you're away somewhere in Nanaimo, but you might like to know about what's going on anyhow. So. Sorry, I was just thinking, you know, if we had a power outage during this very dry season, what about using our, if it's a long-term thing, what about using our generators? And there's some confusion as to whether you can or you can't. Yes, there is. And let's face it, if you have to have your generator running in conditions like this, if you have to have it running, you can operate it. But operate it safely in an area where there's no fuel and be aware of that. I personally, I don't use the generator because I figure I can do without the power for a while. But I know there are people out there who cannot do without that power. And so we just have to be really careful about monitoring, um, especially with generators because of their exhaust systems and all the rest of the things. So having a good clear area for the generator to operate if you must operate it in this weather is really important. Very, very, very important, of course. The, the biggest risk with generators is if you go to refuel it and it's hot at all, it'll explode. So that's going to get your grass and it'll get your sword burn. So if you have to run your generator, try to do it in a really non-combustible zone and have a fire extinguisher and water ready because, yeah, it's, it's a risk, but it happens. It does happen because a friend of mine made the unfortunate mistake of refueling her generator last winter and ended up getting very severely burned, so be very careful about that. Let it cool off for a few minutes before you try to refuel at all. It just, it's just makes sense. It applies to everything that has a hot engine, even if it's the tractor for cutting the lawn or whatever. Be careful about it. But do join the Voyant Alert because uh, this really works. Now, the only time this can't get to you, of course, is if you have call control on your phone line. 
and uh, if some, I have this on one of my lines, so the uh, computer can't uh, manage to contact you there, but perhaps they can contact one of the cell phones uh, that we have in the family. So be careful about that. Um, if you don't have, you give them the information about both lines. Of course, there would be information often displayed on TV, but if the power's out, you wouldn't be able to watch that either. But do join this group because it's really important for notifying you. This kind of thing would notify residents in Nanaimo, for example, if there was an issue with their water quality, their drinking water quality. Simple things like that. If there was any kind of a disaster on the other side, it would also tell you that. And it's a good way to be able to get a message out to everybody all at once. Unless, of course, your phone line's broken. So the next thing that I'd like to talk about um, having everyone do is to prepare a grab-and-go bag. If you get a notice to leave your home and you, someone says to you, well, I'd like you to be ready in 10 minutes to leave. We'll be back here with the bus to get you. Um, sometimes people get uh, really concerned and they don't know what to take with them and they haven't got time to grab it and they end up walking out of their house to be away from home for two or three days and then after they've left, they, they remember some of the things they might need. And so what I have today to hand out to everyone here, and I hope everyone's got one of these now, it's called uh, Be Disaster Ready, Prepare, Grab and Go. And this is a list of things that are recommended by the province that you have in your grab and go bag. There are some additional things that um, I would like people to put in their grab and go bag. Because we live on an island and the resources that we have here are very limited, it's important for you to also consider having a grab and go bag for your pets because um, if it's necessary for you to leave them at home or take them with you, we don't know what, what would happen, but at least have a grab-and-go bag ready for your pets. Make sure that if you have <coughs> some food in that grab-and-go bag and in your own grab-and-go bag, be very careful about how you're uh, looking after that food. We've had several little disasters around with people putting food, especially organic foods, in their grab-and-go bag. And after maybe as little as two months, the, the bags that are sealed still end up infested with insects. And whether it's your chocolate bars or your protein bar or your dog's food or your cat food, it's a big issue because those bags come with the insect eggs in them from the manufacturer. And regardless of whether it's sitting in the closet or whatever it's doing, they do hatch and they do take over and infest the food. So be very careful about uh, about storing any kind of foods like that and several people have told me about their their, their disappointment when they opened up their eat more chocolate bar to find maggots in it or their their protein <coughs> bar to find out that it was all full of bugs it can be very disappointing so keep on top of that business of having emergency snacks and those emergency snacks are really important pardon pardon me what freezing no no we all know insects can survive freezing, right? In the winter, a lot of the stuff gets frozen and they still come back to, to haunt us. So I think that freezing is a good idea to kill off some things. And vacuum packing it kills off other things. But you're never really sure, so it's important for you to double check those uh, the resources that, in, that are in your grab and go bag. The other thing that's really important for you to have um, ready to go with you are medications because if you have medications for two or three days at least and you get, um, and you get exported off the island, along with all the other people that are getting moved around on the other side, it might be difficult to get some of the specialized items that you need. So I highly recommend you have some emergency medications in the bag that you're uh, in your grab and go bag. And the other thing you can't do is just take a bunch and throw them all together in one, one container because you might be cross-contaminating certain drugs with other drugs. So be very careful about how you store those things in that uh, grab-and-go bag. The other thing I highly recommend in your grab-and-go bag that will help us, if you get separated from your pets um, or you get separated from other members of your family, um, it's important for the reception centre where I would be or the reception centre, the same area where the pets and livestock group would be, it's important for us to be able to identify who goes with whom. So if you if you're, uh, have a picture of your family and your pets all together in one picture, and then you have that in your grab and go bag, and something happens that you get separated from someone, or you get separated from your pet, 
if you can take that information to the reception center and post it, then you, it'll be pretty easy to connect you with your pet that might be out there. Now, last year we did some emergency evacuations, and it so happened during, during a, an emergency evacuation that actually happened. Somebody left their cat in the car on a day like this. It was too hot, and so the police came and took the cat out of the car and brought it to the reception center. But the cat, of course, couldn't talk, and it didn't have a label, and it didn't have a tattoo, and it didn't have any kind of a collar with information. So we had to sit there with this cat and, and keep it the way we would just any other pet during an emergency and wait for someone to show up to get it. It wasn't very convenient when the person who showed up to get the cat said it, the cat belonged to him because we couldn't really be sure. And we don't like to release animals like that to somebody unless we're positive, but if you had that picture, in your grab-and-go bag, it would be really easy to connect family. And reception centers on the island, the purpose of the reception center, whether it's here or Kamloops or Kelowna or whatever, it's reunification. It's placement of you in a place where you can get some support. You're only going to get support from the province for about three days, and after that you're on your own. So knowing that, it's really important for you to have all those important documents in your grab-and-go bag. That means copies of your insurance, copies of your driver's license, copies of all the important documents that you might need to put in a claim to get support to help pay for hotel rooms or food or whatever. The other thing that's really important to have in that grab-and-go bag is some money. Every single emergency we've had here has resulted in the same thing. We always run out of gas at the gas station. Frequently we can't get propane. And we also run out of money at the money station. And so you need some cash to be able to buy things that you might need. And the other thing we have a propensity for running out of is basic food. The shelves are empty and now you can't buy food. And if you can't get to the other side to buy food or have somebody bring it over for you, then you're kind of stuck. There's only food on Vancouver Island for about three days. So um, it's a good reason for you to now start to think, well, if there's only food uh, for three days on Vancouver Island, and all our services come from Vancouver Island, maybe we should look at some long-term storage here. And so storing stuff that can be canned things or dry things that are vacuum packed, stored in containers that can't be accessed by rodents, really important for you. And that's where the Neighborhood <coughs> Emergency Preparedness Program really takes over. If you as a group know that you're going to be stuck here, you can't go anywhere, and let's face it, if there was an earthquake, you're not going to get transported out of here to Nanaimo because there'll be so many people in trouble in Nanaimo, there won't be any resources there for you. And so you're going to be stuck here. So I want you to make the best of being stuck here in your neighborhood and make yourselves as comfortable as you can. And this is where you should start to work together as a team and say, learn to talk to each other, learn to know each other's needs, and the other thing is, let's make a plan to stay here if there's an emergency. I mean, I can look over there and see that little shed over there, and if we had an earthquake and the, glasses were, the glass was broken in the house or anything, it might be a place where people could reside safely out of the weather. And places like Arbutus offering up big rolls of poly could be really important for you to have on hand Keep it out of the sun and keep it safe and know that if there's a window broken during the emergency, you could cover that area and still be quite comfortable in your house. You might be a bit cold, but if you could cover the window with some of that poly that they have available right now, then uh, you'd be able to stay in your house a little longer. The other thing is that you'll need tarps. You might have to stay outside because there could be a house in, an a in the area which is not livable, not safe to be in. And so you need some resources to be able to gather someplace with underneath tarps, bring your resources together, barbecues, for example. If there's 30 houses, don't be running 30 barbecues. For heaven's sakes, bring your resources together and try to save the fuel that you have and use it wisely. Use up the food in the freezer first. Use the, the barbecues so that you're running as few barbecues as possible to make your fuel last longer because fuel will be really limited. The priority for, for fuel distribution is police, fire and ambulance. And so, you know, the last time we had an emergency there were people sitting in the hours on the side of the road for hours waiting for fuel. And then it gets dispensed in very small quantities if it is at all. So be aware of that. and. Um, Try to have extra fuel on hand all the time. And that includes in your vehicle. 
If your tank is full in the winter time or the summer time both, you know that you have the resources for you to perhaps leave the island. But if there is an emergency and you have to leave the island, there are a lot of people who will be going and lining up the gas station to get fuel because they're driving on empty. And you just can't do that here. It's, it just can't happen here because you should be prepared for yourself and your family. Having extra fuel on hand is important, but if you're going to have extra fuel on hand as well, um, store your fuel on top of a piece of wood or on a shelf, not directly on the ground. If you just take your gas can and leave it sitting on the ground, there's condensation that will form inside that tank and will uh, contaminate your fuel. So try and keep your fuel safe as well for whatever you're using for. And the other thing, if it's going to be sitting in that container during the winter, make sure you put stabilizer in it. It's a simple addition of a few mils of, of stabilizer to keep the fuel good for the winter. And if you need fuel for your generator, you probably will. If you need fuel for your barbecue, have extra bottles. And um, like Carol said, make sure you put those away from the house if there's any kind of an emergency. But on the other hand, uh, storing them in your garage or wherever to keep them safe so that they're available when you need them. I recommend that um, you think about some long-term storage of resources that you can move out of the house in case your house is damaged. If your house is damaged and you have one of those great big black garbage containers that has wheels on it, you can put a lot of stuff in there for the family. And it doesn't matter how heavy it is because you can usually move it around pretty easily because of the wheels. So you just tip it up and can pull it. So you can put canned goods, water, extra clothing, extra shoes, extra pet food, all those things in that area. And we have a, a, a I have a resource that's uh, available called 26 Weeks to Emergency Preparedness. And what they do with this little, uh, little pamphlet is they tell you one item to put in that, that big container per week or per month. Just add something each time that you think you might need or it's recommended for that container. So that in the event that you couldn't stay at your house and you had to move your stuff to some other location, you'd have a good stash of things that, that are important to you that you could take with you. Make sure that you have lots of those extra emergency blankets. They're available at the dollar store for about a dollar each. Those little silver emergency blankets, you should have them in the glovey of your car because you can use them at emergencies, at accidents, if you happen to come across one. I've used mine as a tarp to put a deer on because I can pull a big deer off the road on a tarp, but I can't carry it. And so those kinds of resources, having them, and they don't take up any space in your glovey, and if a mouse is living in your car, it won't eat it either. So those little blankets are really important for, uh, to have as a resource because if you were sitting here and it was the fall, if you could just wrap one of those around you, it's not like a sleeping bag that can get wet or anything. It reflects the heat back onto you and it's really useful, a really useful tool. You can also get water at many of the supply, emergency supply stores that's in vacuum packed and little vacuum packed sealed bags that's good for about five years. And a good place to go for resources that you might want to take is Cabela's. Cabela's has quite a large selection of dehydrated foods that are in foil, so creatures can't get in there. And they also have a large um, a collection of things that are good for camping. And this is what you'll be doing if your house isn't going to be very usable. Gabriola doesn't offer much in the way of resources for you. The hotels are limited. The spaces for, uh, for taking a room are very limited and frequently not available. So be aware that you may end up camping. So whatever you can do to make yourself more comfortable at home is really important. So if you're going to Nanaimo, I'd suggest that grab and go bag that you have is with you in Nanaimo when you're in Nanaimo. Because if anything happens that there is a disaster when you're not at home, you're gonna be stuck there. And you'll probably, and you, if you're stuck there for a couple of days sitting in the, sitting in the center, where there's just masses of people all sitting around waiting for something to happen, um, it would be really nice if you had your grab-and-go bag with you. I don't think you should go to Nanaimo without it. It's easy to have it in your car, doesn't take up a lot of space, just to be sure that you're safe over there. Having extra water with you and that sort of thing is important too. Thank you. And there's some filled out information. Oh, perfect. Okay. Good. Thank you. So have your grab-and-go bag with you so that um, if anything happens, you're not stuck there without the resources you need. The other thing that uh, happened here when we've had disasters before is that the pharmacy, of course, runs out of products that uh, they might need to fill prescriptions. So 
think ahead on your prescriptions and don't wait till the last <coughs> minute to call for prescription <coughs> fills because apparently uh, there are lots of different kinds of drugs that are used that are uh, just not available on short notice. So have those extras with you when you're away and uh, you're, on the, you're in Vancouver or you're in, uh, in Nanaimo. Nanaimo doesn't seem very far away, but if something happened that we had an earthquake, for example, probably one of the things that would be really affected would be the landing site for the ferries, the docks. And if those docks are damaged, you know how long it takes to get things like that fixed. And so you may be stuck in Nanaimo a lot longer than you expected. And we know it already happens, so be prepared by having your grab-and-go bag with you. If it's not convenient for you to take it out of the house and take it with you when you're leaving all the time, then make two. Make one for the family. Do something to make sure that you have resources. And of course, make sure you have a first aid kit. And one of the things you should have in your neighborhood emergency meeting place, of course, is a first aid kit. The other thing that many neighborhoods now are starting to do, because they, this neighborhood will be, wants to communicate with another neighborhood to see if they need resources that they can share, and that means that you should inventory your resources. Do you have any, do you have any nurses? Do you have any doctors? Do you have any carpenters? Do you have anyone who can help fix the well? Know your resources. So somebody doing an inventory of resources in this neighborhood would be very useful. You don't share the information with anybody except for your neighborhood. Look after yourselves because you're going to be on your own and the province is not going to walk up and, and start doing things for you like people think they will. They don't do that. And if you're going to think that, oh, you'll go and get food, I've been served the food that they serve during conferences because they were trying to teach us about how delicious the food would be. I'd rather eat stuff out of a can at my own house than some of the stuff being served. And so um, be prepared to you know, stay in place, stay together and stay strong as a group because you're the best ones to look after you, better than anybody else that there is. It also means if there's a, a person here in this group who's a, a team leader, they, can, they will get information from the fire department or from the police department and dispensing that information to the neighborhood on behalf of fire or police is really important for sharing information that is accurate. Be careful about the information that you read on Facebook. There's lots of misinformation there. Um, the RDN has told me that they will put information on uh, Instagram and they will put information on uh, Twitter but they don't generally use Facebook for information. So the RDN will have a website. The RDN will have what's called an emergency operations center functional. And the emergency operations center will be at the, at the RDN uh, city hall. And that emergency operations center will have our guy Paul Giffen there running the ham radio and commuting, commuting, communicating directly with the mobile ham radios that we have on Gabriola Island. So if there was a neighborhood being evacuated, that mobile ham radio would come right to your neighborhood and be right there. So you could communicate directly with the emergency operations center. And it's a very important tool in the evacuation process because when you come to an area where you're being evacuated from, the ham radio operator will be recording your name and address and the number of people that are attending um, and collecting information for the purpose of inventorying all the people that are getting out so that uh, police and fire know that everybody's been evacuated there isn't somebody left behind and it, it happens um, it happened in our practices where people decide I'm not going to participate in the evacuation and they just go back to bed well then of course when you get to the, the, the reception center and you start inventorying the people it does have a, a, a negative effect on the efficiency of the uh, of the uh, reception center where you're supposed to be checking in so be cognizant of that kind of thing and if you have neighbors that have disabilities and you know you can help them by giving, putting the sign out for them, or they're not here today because you know they couldn't get here today, I have some extra brochures to hand to them to help them with some information for uh, what to do and what to expect to happen if they were required to leave their home. And I'm sure there must be some people in, in every neighborhood that could probably benefit by having this. Be the person who's who's going along and getting on the bus and be the person who's getting off the bus and, and going and seeing the ham radio operator. Be that person because that's experience and training for you. And the training for you as a resident is just as important as it is for me as the person who's trying to organize the reception center. 
We have had reception centers here in the past and the reception center will be located at the point where um, it makes the most sense for it to be. So in the past when I've opened a reception center, I opened the Rolo Center and it's a particularly great place to be because my resources for all the emergency support are in the downstairs at the fire hall. Easy to get over there. Fire is really, really close of course and then the ambulance is really close. So, and the other thing that's really close is that a reception center is not a restaurant. It's not a place you go to to sit around and have a meal because I won't be serving any meals there. The only thing that will be served at a reception center will be coffee, tea, and maybe some little sandwiches or something, just enough. Um, you only go to the reception center and stand around there. You saw the lineups at Cologne, huge lineups. You can't stand in that lineup for, for a couple of hours. A lot of people can't even stand for an hour. So what you would do in our situation is you would you know you need to go and register at the re reception center. So what I would do is you'd probably come to the Rolo Center and you'd be sent over to that church on the corner of Church and, and North Road. And you can go in there and they have a kitchen, a proper kitchen. They have lots of tables and in the winter time they have heat pumps and they have a place for you to go and sit at a table and be in a civilized situation until you can come to the reception center and register. And that's really important. It's also been a warming center when it got too cold and people didn't have heat in their houses. And that's a perfect situation because you could walk down or you could take the bus down from the church over to the Rolo uh, Center to register. But the Rolo Center is a small place. And although they have a kitchen, uh, it's difficult to provide much in the way of resources. And I found that my experience with reception centers is that a lot of people just need to leave home and they want to go and sit and visit with somebody and feel like they're not by themselves out in the middle of nowhere. And if there's no heat in their house, they need a place to go to. So coming to the reception center to register to say, oh, I need to be relocated somewhere, fine. But if there isn't space for you to be in that building, and it's a limited building, very small, then I'd just send you off to the, the big church and there's lots of places in there for you to sit and be warm. I'll tell you right now, last winter when, when it was really cold and we did open the place, uh, I'll remind you that if you're going there and you're moving around like that in the winter, I can't say that that building is as warm as it could be because they're using heat pumps. So be cognizant of any of those kinds of little details when you're, <coughs> if you're going to be going and, and waiting someplace at all, make sure you've got extra warm clothing to look after yourself because of course we don't have resources here. We just don't have it. And if it's on a school day, you can't, go to the, you can't go to the school because the school's closed to the public. It's open exclusively for the students and you can't have the public going in there. So be prepared to, you know, go to the reception center and maybe get sent someplace else to put in time, do that kind of thing. It's the resources are there, we do the best that we can, but uh, the spaces are small on Gabriola. The space, if it were at the south end of the island and there was going to be a reception center, it would be downstairs at the community hall. That's the space that's been designated. The community hall and the Rolo Center both have big generators that come on automatically if the power goes off. And the RDN pays for the fuel to run those generators. So there's power there and the one thing I try to have, as many as I can have of, and I'm always interested in anybody wants to donate one, are power bars because I found with the last emergency, there was a particular abundance of people who wanted to charge up all their toys, their phones and this and that. And so if you can bring a power bar with you, uh, then it's better for, for the generator to be able to give you power and make sure you can plug in. Because there's a limited number of plug-ins in these old buildings. But we can always run lots of uh, power bars. So keep that in mind. And also try to be a little bit self-sufficient with a, maybe a portable battery or chargers in your vehicles. Because if you, if you can run your vehicle because you want to get information, then uh, of course um, you can charge your toys in, in your car as well. If you have a wind-up radio, you know the thing. I want to tell you about, I've done lots of research on the wind-up radio and they're a disaster. Because the minute you buy a wind-up radio and you bring it home, well guess what you want to do? you want to turn it on, wind it up and see if it works. That's the end of the radio now because unless you're planning on doing that until every day until the disaster, um, it won't last. Once you activate that radio, it's uh, done. And I tried several before, at first I thought it was my fault because I didn't know any better. I started up and all this kind of thing. 
But the other thing too is that if you can possibly uh, look at getting a radio through Red Cross that has, uh, has ports for charging things and it's solar powered, that would be really handy to have. And then you're more independent. And it's amazing how much charging you can get even on the cloudiest day on uh, Gabriola. It's really quite amazing. All you can try to do is work together and, and try and make sure that we're safe. I had somebody at my house one night for dinner. On their way home, they were following a car in the tunnel. And the guy threw a butt out of his car into the tunnel. So she said, should I go after him or should I check? And thank goodness she did go and check because the butt was already starting to burn and she had to stomp it out. So I know about fires a little bit. One time I started a fire in the Muskeg when I was getting out of a helicopter. The exhaust pipe from the Hughes 500 started the Muskeg on fire right beside where I was. And so I got out of the helicopter anyway, and then the, the pilot tried to blow the fire back on me while I tried to put it out. I couldn't put it out. And even though the soil and everything, it's muskeg, it's all wet, I couldn't put the fire out. And a bomber was there in about 10 minutes and bombed it. But nevertheless, it's pretty scary when it starts to really roar along. And if you look at the fire in Lahaina, of course, was so fast and furious. And it melted the aluminum wheels on cars. It, it just did so much damage, it's just incomprehensible. Well, we've had, um, you know, more than a week of uh, high winds. Yes. Yeah. So a fire happening in a high wind would be a different can of worms and yes. they may not be able to be contained. So well, that's what happened in Lahaina, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very scary. But the other thing that's the most scary combined with the high winds is very low humidity. High humidity really helps to control things. And all this green vegetation that we have is wonderful. But the one thing you can do is in those places where you have branches like this that are touching the grass, see how low they are? Those branches that are touching the grass along here are an ideal connection between the grass and the big tree. So it's a good idea to what you call raise the crown on the big trees like this so that the fire, if it is on the ground, is likely to run to the edge and then stop and not get up into the branches. And the lower branches of these trees are senile old branches that should Really, they play a very, very minor role ecologically in the ecology of the tree. And so it would be good to get rid of those branches around the bottom, and especially since you can see they have little dry bits in them. So anything you can do like that to help fire smart around uh, your neighborhood is, and, your, and of course your yard is really useful. I know fire's pretty scary. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV. Community Television. For you. By you. My name is Marshall Fries with Gabriel TV and today I am talking to Shirley Nicholson. I'm the team leader for Emergency Support Services Gabriel. Uh, it's nice to meet you Shirley and thank you for your talk today. You're Can you welcome. tell us a little bit more about your background? Well I'm a biologist and uh, an arborist, uh, aquatic ecologist. But um, all my life I've always been really concerned about emergency preparedness and um, in my previous employee I didn't really have an opportunity to do anything about it but then when I came here there was a, a real need to look at being self-sufficient and I really like that. And I like being prepared, I've had a few disappointments and so I think encouraging people to be independently functional and safe in a place like this where we're living in a small pocket of the earth where uh, we're really limited on what we can do and we're limited on how we can get away from here and that sort of thing. Um, what, what advice would you give to people who are coming to the island for the first time, they've never been here, what, what, what would you want them to know? Well, I, I think the first thing I always, they, everyone thinks this is funny, but I say, well, first thing you need to do is to recognize that around about December 15, 16 or 17, the power is going to be off for two or three days. And if you don't have a generator, you won't have any water and perhaps no heat. So maybe you need to look at being prepared to uh, live in your house for a couple of days with those little resources missing. And it's not always something that you're taught when you're buying your house here. And it's winter, of course, so we usually get snow in December. And the road plowing is not uh, uh, the same as if you live in the city. The roads are open depending on the, the need and the resources that they need to serve. So you may be, if you're on a back, you know, a side road or whatever, maybe your road won't be plowed. I was going to ask, what are some common things that you feel like people who, who live here might not know, even though they live here, even though they are aware of the risk? What are some common issues that people might not be aware of? I think they... they 
don't know the limited resources that we can have on the island when it comes to fuel and food and uh, supports um, to keep us at home comfortably and that's why I say people really need to prepare for protecting themselves and shelter in place and be safe and as comfortable as possible and there's no reason for people being uncomfortable or suffering or not not having the resources they need if they work together and teamwork is everything here. Teamwork in these neighborhoods will make it easy for these people to be, to be uh, healthy and to be happy and enjoy the time that they do have together and make the best of it. You know, whereas if you live in the city, perhaps you think somebody's going to look after you and you don't have any resources. Or if you lived in an apartment building or whatever, um, and just imagine how it was when the people were confined to home because of COVID. We didn't change our lifestyle. We went outside and worked with the animals and played in the garden and did all the things we normally did. So it didn't really have much of an impact on us as it did in the city. Hmm. Um, what, you, you mentioned, you spoke about the power of community organization, being organized as a neighborhood. What else can the fire department here, the authorities do to help either spread the message or be proactive about this situation, the fire situation? Well, I think that um, it's up to people to learn how to be independent and to learn how to take care of themselves. And the fire department is not a babysitting service. Um, they provide open houses to educate people on everything from using fire extinguishers to, to teaching kids how to handle hoses during fires and educating them about the importance of firemen and policemen and all these resources in our neighborhood. And I think it's up to us to help the fire department and the police department and all the other people work as efficiently as they can and provide the best service they can and when we're educated about how to help them evacuate us or help them um, notify us and all those kinds of things then uh, we're we're really benefiting ourselves it's a kind of a selfish move but sure helps the fire department and in turn they can help us more than ever it's like leaving the gate open if there's a fire if you want to leave home and close the gate and they're in your neighborhood and they're fighting fire in your neighborhood and they can't get into your yard, I guess they won't come in and put any water on your house. So help them as much as you can. Now you mentioned you were going to be doing more of these talks. This is something you do regularly? Regularly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about upcoming talks you're going to be giving and where you're going to be giving those and kind of the have people have, have people or uh, requested that you come speak or it's up to the individual to request a presentation a neighborhood emergency preparedness presentation and um, they usually contact me and say well what do I do and then I give them a, a, a series of suggestions on what to do and so there's all kinds of things people are doing some are more creative than the others um, I can think of one neighborhood where they all got together for a potluck and then they had a, a little competition to see who could produce the most interesting disaster cake so there was earthquake cake and there was, you know, rapid defiring. It was all kinds of things like that or else it's a potluck or sometimes it's a brunch. And it's often like today, it's the first time these people have gotten together. And I remember the last place I made a presentation, this lady who was new to the neighborhood came up and said to this lady right in front of me, now I'll know you're my neighbor when I see you in the grocery store. She didn't know that before and they live right beside each other. So it's a good opportunity for people to meet and, and say, during a disaster, you know who your neighbor is. Mm -hmm. And if you know who he is, you'll probably spend a lot of time sitting at a table chatting about things to do in the, when there's a lot of downtime. Uh, what can people do to get more involved? Um, like I've, I've lived here for just over six months. If I wanted to be more involved in this initiative, what could I do? Well, you could organize the people that live around you. Um, you could call them and say, are you interested in getting together at my house on, on a date that works and, um, and invite them to come over for a potluck and meet them and that sort of thing. And then you could call me and I would call the, I would say, okay, here's, here's a date for you to pick for a presentation. And then I would say, do you want me to bring the Fire Smart coordinator over to talk about Fire Smart and talk about how to make your house safer if there is a fire? And uh, we just go from there and I say I'll come if it's 50 houses or six houses I don't care as long as you are interested in participating genuinely in the affair it's not information for sharing with everybody all around everywhere and I'm not going to tell you the places I'm presenting because I have so many mm -hmm. um, I have so many right now I'm really busy but nevertheless uh, I can tell you that in the last in the last few weeks I've presented to well over a hundred houses 
and by the time I'm finished at the 1st of October, it'll be over 400. And so neighborhoods are really interested. And in, since I started doing this on Gabriel, I think that I now I'm I'm sure I'm well over a thousand houses that I that have uh, gotten involved in emergency support services secretly, quietly looking after themselves and changing up with the times. And some are having refreshers, like some people here today, and some are brand new to the neighborhood. But we're always open to getting more houses involved because I think uh, we'll be sheltering in place and if we're sheltering in place let's be as comfortable as we can be. Uh, you mentioned seeing a barn burn down when you were a kid. Yes. What that or what other experiences have, have motivated you or make you so passionate about uh, going around and doing what you do? Well I think um, I've seen lots of things that have happened from an minor accidents and you know a fire in my lifetime and a few other things and um, I guess I've witnessed things where people could have stepped up and helped and they were instead of stepping up and putting a hand out to help somebody they just froze because they just froze and it's it's, it's not that uh, I don't tend to freeze when I see something that happens I tend to step in and but I've seen people freeze and it didn't matter how bad the injury was or not they just freeze because they don't know what to do and they never thought about it before and so um, just seeing a car accident and handing somebody a, a blanket to put over them is nothing you, there's nothing to doing that but you can be prepared by having it with you do you, do you feel like meetings like this one are gonna help people kind of just have a pr be prepared for when something does happen I know it I do know it because the people are talking now about, well, I wonder what we what should we inventory here? Do we, do we have, look at, somebody already came up with a list of a presentation I did um, 15 years ago and said, look, we've got some of this work done already, let's add to it. Another lady in this group walked up today and said, I've got an AED, I think we should put it in the main meeting place for the group so they can all share it. I'm never home, I'm hardly ever home, and I why not put it in a common place that everybody knows about? So all of a sudden, a first aid kit and, 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 and that in one spot. Some houses have a backboard, they have people trained on how to carry somebody on a stretcher, people with air horns to call each other, people with radios to talk from one neighborhood to the other, people searching out pathways to get out of here, trails, and using the, the resources on Gabriola, like the, the Gulf Islands. Um, lands and trails maps that are so good at describing ways to get out of here when trails are right on our doorstep and sometimes we don't even know about so it's a good opportunity to get to know the resources in your own neighborhood too uh, do you have any last thing you'd like to say well i'd say if you haven't done so already get serious about sheltering in place um, it's really important um, no one's going to come and babysit you through a disaster and the disaster could take many forms and whether it's a winter storm or it's an earthquake or it's a hurricane like we've had before, it could be anything. So I think um, you have a responsibility to, to take on the, the challenge of being as comfortable as you can be and uh, help your neighbour who can't help themselves as much as possible. Okay, well thank you Shirley. You're welcome. Marshall Freeze with Gabriella TV, and I am speaking with Glennis. Glennis, Stewart, yeah. <laughs> and tell us about what you're doing here today, Glennis. Well, um, some neighbors had talked to me about, um, you know, the fear of fire mostly, and also earthquake. Although we're in a low-risk earthquake zone, uh, especially with the wind and the dryness, um, there's been a lot of people very nervous about what's going on, and um, an acquaintance invited me to the whalebone initial meeting with Shirley Nicholson and it was really good and there was a lot to absorb and a lot to do and it was sort of their neighborhood and I realized that we hadn't done anything in this neighborhood and so I thought it would be a good idea and so I I talked to someone in this and they sort of said uh, you know your place would be good to do <laughs> so, so that's why I'm here all right <laughs> I couldn't escape it <laughs> um. What, what do you think people in the neighborhood and the community can do to just kind of be proactive with the fire situation? I think the main thing you can do is um, look after your house and the area around your house. 
I mean, don't get rid of the trees because the trees, you know, have a lot of benefits. But if you can get rid of, like she said, you know, a five foot area around your house and start working on that. Um, you know, plants that are movable, you can take your, you know, if you can move your house plants quickly and easily, that's a real advantage. Getting rid of dead trees, limbing them up, as she mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we've had an opportunity to have um, the fire department uh, gave us a big dump site this summer and hopefully they'll do it again this fall so we can gather all that up and take it in. Um, if not, we have to take it to Nanaimo. But uh, that's the first first stop, you know, I think, um, to stop the spread of fire. Um, is there anything you feel like the fire department could be doing additionally uh, with this situation? I think another thing that worries people is visitors to the island. Um, you know, and somehow the fire department could put brochures on the ferry, put them, you know, even at the grocery store, because most people hit the grocery store, just saying, you know, fire, extreme fire, here's what to do, here's what not to do. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll let you know, we had an interview with uh, the fire chief, and as a result of that interview, now they're going to be announcing on ferries uh, coming to Gabriola about the fire warning. Oh, great. So that's yeah. kind of a new thing that's yeah, coming in. Yeah. Um, you know, and I had troubles with... Um, I've seen, you know, contractors who, you know, are smokers and smokers in general who are not really aware of how quickly a cigarette can take mm -hmm. off, you know, so that, that can be nerve-wracking. <laughs> I guess that, that's one more thing I want to ask about. Uh, smoking is a great example. What else, what else would you want to tell a visitor to the island who doesn't know the island? What sort of things as a resident would you be concerned that they might not know about? Well, water is a big issue. I mean, you know, people come from the um, mainland and they'll turn on a tap and they'll be washing their hands and the tap's running and running. You know, we'll just turn on the tap, get our hands wet, turn it off, soap up. You know, be con super conscious of your water use. Mm. Um, you know, because we, you know, nothing you need worse is a fire and the wells are drier. Right. You know, water is a big issue and it's going to get a bigger issue as time goes on. Uh, do, do you think the island is ready for an evacuation if we need to? No, not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> and obviously meetings like today are a good step towards that. You know, people are worried about evacuation, but you know, all you need is one road blocked off and you can't get around. And right. all you need is all the cars on the road and we know what that's like to go going to the mainland. <laughs> Nobody moves. Right. You have to be highly organized. I mean, you'd have to have carpooling organized. You'd have to you know, and you have to, it, it depends on the scenario. I mean, there could be a fire on the north end that the wind's blowing, it blows it, you know, very quickly to the south. If it starts on the north end, and we have a northwesterly prevailing in the summer, I mean, that's where all the resources are. That's where the ferry is. That's where a lot of the assembly places are, a lot of evacuation places. So you're going to be, like she's saying, think shelter in place, you know, because that's most likely situation. Could you just tell us, for those who don't know, what is this event all about and why are we here today? Okay, today is um, the emergency preparedness meeting for the Wild Cherry uh, neighbourhood and we're here just to, to make sure that we know what it is we have to do to keep ourselves safe, our neighbours safe and um, take care of the, the most important things to us. And uh, what advice would you have for people who are visiting Gabriel and might not know how serious the, the situation is? What would you tell them if uh, you had a chance to let them know what to, how to act, things not to do? Okay, well, number one, um, just pay attention to the signs because they're well posted uh, around the island. No fires whatsoever right now. Uh, and I think that's standard, hopefully, everywhere in the province uh, right now and even across where, the, where there's been no rain for many, many, many days. Day, uh, days and months and um, just um, be, be uh, cognizant of those things, uh, respect everybody else's um, uh, privacy and um, just follow the rules. Um, and w w what, would, what, are, what are some things that people who live here, residents of the island, maybe don't know about that they should be thinking about? Okay, some of the needs of their neighbors, uh, if you don't know all of your neighbors and, and some of them might be needing uh, more assistance than others, know uh, what to do to help them to make sure that they're safe and what you have to do to make sure that you can take care of them and, um, you know, the go bags and all of those sorts of things. We That's what we're going to be um, talking about today and learning. So we've got a very good speaker down there that is going to provide all that information for us. 
And who's the speaker today? Her name is Shirley Nicholson, and she's um, she's involved with Gabriola uh, Emergency Preparedness uh, for a, a long while, and um, uh, we don't know for sure if there's going to be a representative from the fire department because they're, of course, very busy as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but if they're here, uh, they will provide us uh, with some information, and um, you can get here. You can get your property. Um, the outside of your property assessed for um, fire safety and it's just a, a program that the fire department puts on and it's well worth having them come out. It doesn't cost anything and you have the option of yes or no and yeah, it's great. So is that something anyone who lives on Gabriella can have done? Yes, oh, absolutely. That's, that's good to know. Yes. I think something everyone who lives here should be doing. Exactly, exactly. Um, I was going to ask you like like I live on the island too. What what would someone like myself who wants to get more involved in in fire safety and prevention do? Are there organizations I could join? Is there something I could be involved? I would in? I would uh, contact the fire department here because I mean they're we're all volunteer um, people for for that um, organization, and yes, I would contact them and say, do you have um, people that are a group that I can join to to help? Uh, with this, and I'm quite sure that Shirley has that information as well. Okay, and are are you a volunteer firefighter yourself? Uh, no, I'm not. What I am is just I'm a lion here on on oh, okay. Rola, and uh, so is Shirley. And uh, we had uh, she pr presented that to our group um, last year, and uh, with with the dryness that we are seem to be getting more and more and more each summer, uh, I think it's just a great idea that every neighborhood does this. And uh, maybe you could tell me what are what are some things that um, people should be watching out for, or what can you do? If what should you do if you see signs of fire? If you see signs of people being not unsafe with regards uh, to fire? Report it immediately. Um, if you can, put the fire out. Um, there's, you know, you don't want to to um, be confrontational, but you do want to, to be safe, and you let them know that that they're con you're concerned about them as well. Do you feel like the authorities are doing enough about the situation? Uh, well, you or is know, there anything you would suggest or you would like yeah. to see? Um, well, for this island, because we are rural, uh, it that is a bit of a, a situation, and I don't want to get into politics about yeah. that at all. Um, but I just want uh, everybody to be cognizant of the situation, and it's it's not just the authorities that are responsible; it's us. And okay. I guess that's the most important thing. And uh, one one last question for you here: mm -hmm. um, Do you feel that the island is ready? For a potential evacuation, in in if that if we have to do that, um, to be honest with you, I don't think so. Okay. I think mo a lot of people um, are aware, but it's just getting to um, have more awareness, and and um, I think we would do very well. There's been notifications in the paper, um, and so it's it's growing. I mean, the concern is there, and we have to be well aware of it and just learn as much as we can. Okay. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. So Marsh, it sounds like a lot of islanders are worried about the wildfire risk. Yes, as Shirley Nicholson said, she's done hundreds of these neighborhood meetings in the last couple of weeks, and she's planning on completing 400 by October. 400, wow. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. Well, that's it for us here at Island View. Thanks for tuning in to Gabriela TV, and we'll see you next week.